During today's lecture, we're going to discuss the contributions of various individuals to what later became known as the cell theory. The first of these individuals is the English scientist Robert Hooke, who is often credited with the discovery of cells in the 17th century while observing thin sections of cork tissue. Upon observing this tissue under what today would be considered a very primitive microscope, Hooke noticed that these cells appeared to be empty, and therefore he coined the term cell after an empty room. The question that you should consider is why did these cork cells observed by Hooke appear to be empty? Next we have the Dutch naturalist Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who was known to produce some of the most powerful lenses of his day capable of magnifying a specimen up to 270 times its actual size. And it's Leeuwenhoek who is often credited with the observation of the first living cells, such as sperm cells or protists found in pond water, as well as red blood cells and even bacteria. Now, if we take a look at the primitive microscopes used by both Hook and Leeuwenhoek, we'll notice that the specimen to be viewed is placed on this stylus, which is directly over an opening containing a lens. The distance of the specimen from the lens is controlled by a screw, which is essentially acting as a focus. The viewer would then view the specimen from the opposite side of this metal plate. A contemporary of both Hook and Leeuwenhoek is Marcello Malpighi, who was often regarded as being the father of histology. Histology is simply the study of tissues, and it was Malpighi, using his microscope, which was the first to observe blood flow in capillary vessels, the air sacs or alveoli in lung tissue, as well as the respiratory and excretory systems of insects. During the 19th century, great advances in microscope technology enabled researchers to observe specimens in far greater detail than ever before. Using cutting-edge microscopes of their day, Matthias Schleiden, Theodor Schwann, and Rudolf Virchow made groundbreaking observations that would con contribute to the formulation of what we now regard as the classic cell theory. Schleiden's contribution to the classic cell theory came from his observation of plant tissues under the microscope, after which he concluded that all plant matter is composed of cells. Similarly, Theodor Schwann observed a variety of animal tissue under the microscope, afterward concluding that all animal matter is composed of cells. Lastly, Rudolf Virchow, based on his research, concluded that all cells must result from a reproductive process and therefore do not arise spontaneously. Hence, all cells arise from pre-existing cells. The observations of Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow became organized into what is now known as the classic cell theory, which simply states that cells are both the basic unit of structure and function of all organisms. Moreover, cells result from the reproductive processes of other cells. As we would expect, the classic cell theory has since been modified due to significant advances in microscopy in the nearly century and a half since it was first proposed. The modern cell theory is the result of the aforementioned advancements in microscope technology since the 19th century. And as you can see, it preserves the three basic tenets proposed by Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow. It also adds that cells carry out a metabolism, which involves a series of chemical reactions which are vital to sustaining the cell's life functions. It also states 
that cells contain hereditary information, generally in the form of DNA. Lastly, all cells are basically the same in their composition. In other words, all cells will exhibit the same types of structures, but may differ in the quantities of these structures based on their specific function. Now, as we will see, there are some entities that exist that at least at first glance can't be explained by the basic tenets of the cell theory. The first anomaly that seemingly contradicts modern cell theory concerns the origins of the first cell. Now, while it's true that all cells come from pre-existing cells, this cannot hold true for the first cell. The first cell must have arisen from the self-assembly of various non-living components. Based on fossil evidence, the first cells to appear on Earth were prokaryotic, anaerobic, as well as heterotrophic, first arriving on the scene somewhere around 3.9 billion years ago. Now, there is strong evidence to suggest that cells could have arisen from the self-assembly of non-living components. The Miller-Urey experiment in the early 1950s illustrated this point, and this is something that we'll investigate in greater detail later on this year. Another anomaly that seemingly contradicts cell theory concerns the existence of viruses. Viruses are non-cellular entities in that they are not composed of cells, but rather almost exclusively of an outer protein coat and a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA. Viruses do contain some structures and carry out some processes exhibited by living cells, but are missing many of the others. And as a result, they are considered by many scientists as being non-living. The existence of mitochondria and chloroplasts seemingly pose a problem for the modern cell theory. However, as we will see, their existence makes a lot more sense when we view them through the lens of evolutionary history. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts are non-cellular, self-replicating entities. This is because both structures contain their own DNA, produce their own RNA, contain their own ribosomes, and produce much of their own protein. The existence of these features, as well as the location of mitochondria and chloroplasts within modern eukaryotic cells, strongly suggests that they derived or descended from bacterial ancestors. Through genetic analysis, it has been determined that the modern mitochondria shares a close relationship with bacteria belonging to a group known as rickettsia. This group is pathogenic or disease-causing, often responsible for such diseases as typhoid or Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Genetic analysis has also revealed that the modern chloroplasts are most closely related to cyanobacteria, which can be found in moist environments both on land and in aquatic ecosystems. The event that was responsible for the ancestors of the modern mitochondria and chloroplast to forge a relationship with early eukaryotic cells is known as endosymbiosis, something that we will expand on in great detail later on in this chapter. In this section, we're going to take a look at various techniques that have enabled researchers to identify cellular structures as well as to determine their specific function. If you've ever looked at a diagram of a cell in a textbook, you will have noticed that the cell is composed of a variety of structures or organelles, such as the cytoskeleton 
or centrioles, the mitochondria, or the ER. You may have also wondered how it is that we know how these organelles are structured as well as what their specific functions are. Now, in order to determine the structure and function of any cellular component, researchers must first isolate and obtain large enough amounts of each organelle in order to study. And by studying the structure of each organelle, it is possible for a researcher to make a reasonable inference as to the specific function of the organelle. The process by which cellular organelles are isolated in great enough quantities so that their structure and function can be studied is known as cell fractionation. The process starts with obtaining a tissue sample derived from either plant or animal matter, after which the tissue sample is homogenized, whereupon the tissue mass is disrupted or broken apart either by chopping it up in a blender or even exposing the tissue sample to high-frequency sound waves. The resulting soupy cellular mixture is often referred to as a homogenate. In order to isolate and accumulate large quantities of any one organelle within the homogenate, it must be placed into a centrifuge whereupon it is spun at a very high speed. The centrifugal force generated by the centrifuge will act to separate these organelles according to their respective densities. Ultimately, a solid pellet will form at the bottom of the tube, which represents the most dense cellular components within the homogenate. During the first spin, this is almost always composed of nuclei. The supernatant represents the part of the homogenate that failed to accumulate within the pellet. In order to isolate progressively less dense cellular components, the liquid supernatant is poured off into another tube, which is subsequently centrifuged at a higher speed, eventually giving rise to a pellet containing the next densest cellular components, represented by mitochondria and, if present, chloroplasts. Each round of centrifugation involves spinning the supernatant at progressively higher and higher speeds in order to isolate progressively less dense cellular components. Eventually, after several rounds of centrifugation, the remaining supernatant will contain cellular components that are very similar in their respective densities. Therefore, any further centrifugation would not successfully isolate these cellular components into separate pellets. At this point, another technique must be applied in order to successfully separate these components. This tube containing homogenate is similar to what we may obtain after several rounds of differential centrifugation in which the cellular components vary very little with regards to their respective densities. In order to separate these particular components, we must apply a technique known as density gradient centrifugation. During this procedure, the homogenate will be poured into a sugar solution whose concentration increases with increasing depth, creating a density gradient. The organelles within the homogenate will begin to fall through the density gradient ultimately finding a level in which their density equals that of their surroundings, upon which they will begin to accumulate in layers. Therefore, a combination of both 
differential centrifugation and density gradient centrifugation is necessary in order to successfully isolate all cellular components so that their structures as well as their function can be identified and described.